<laughs> what do you like about Easter? Celebrate with your family. Easter hunting for eggs. You get to open them and there's stuff in there. Money and grass. Lots of candy. What does the Easter bunny do? Hops. He hides the eggs. He's a person that's dressed up in a costume. Who is Jesus? Jesus is like a person God. He is God's son. What does Jesus look like? Long brown hair and a brown beard. And he's got like a robe on. He has this belt, like what karate people wear, I think. Who are the disciples? Twelve chosen followers of Jesus. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, and Valphius, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, Bartholomew. And they're the good guys. What did Jesus teach? How to pray and that God's real. To always love one another when it's hard. Teaching them about Christmas and Valentine's Day. What kinds of miracles did Jesus do? He turned water into wine. He made five loaves and two fishes spread a long way. He helped people if they were sick. He walked on water. There was a storm and it was all windy and they said, Jesus, Jesus, and then he calmed it down so, so they won't be scared. What would be a really cool miracle for him to do? For me to be a superhero like Batman. Let me ride a shark. Fix the government. What did they eat at the Last Supper? Bread and like some dipping sauce. Take a nugget and french rice and there's the juice. Some vegetables with chocolate on it. Why did some people not like Jesus? That everybody was calling him king. They didn't believe that he was God's son. They thought he would only hang out with the people who had done no sin, but he helped the sinners because they're the ones who needed help. What did those people do to Jesus? There were swords trying to capture him, whipped him, and put a crown of thorns on his head, and made him carry the cross a long way. Put him on a cross and stab him. They hurted his heart. He died on Good Friday. And then somebody put him in a tube that had this big rock over it. What happened on Sunday morning? He grew from the ground. He rose from the dead. What did the disciples do when they saw Jesus? Very afraid, thought he was a ghost. They saw the scars, they touched him. Jesus, Jesus is alive, but my love him. They were so happy. How do we follow Jesus? Confess our sins. We ask him into our heart by praying. And then he's like in our heart. <laughs> Why did Jesus do all of this? It was all for us because he loves us. He said, I don't want them to be scared and whenever they're hurt, I want to help. Today's Easter Sunday. I'd certainly like to call it Resurrection Sunday. In fact, I think, Brad, that's what you called it earlier, and you were right on the money with that. So, Easter has all kinds of meanings for us. For some, it's about eggs and baskets and bunnies and chocolate and a meal with ham. Or if you're my daughter, we're having ham, and I had to buy her steak because she doesn't like ham. Uh, Whatever. It's, we're on shaky ground. <laughs> um, but the resurrection speaks to a great miracle that took place on our behalf. The resurrection of Christ is the, is the very event upon which our whole faith and eternity are dependent upon. So resurrection day, it's, it's kind of important, isn't it? Uh, among other things, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is truly a miracle, and in fact is the grandest miracle of them all, Jesus overcoming death for us. How incredible. I do want to talk about miracles today. An alcoholic became a believer, was asked how he could possibly believe all the nonsense in the Bible about miracles. You don't believe that Jesus changed the water into wine, do you? 
I sure do, because in our house, Jesus changed the whiskey into furniture. Amazing how that happens, right? The Apostle John wrote about many of the miracles of Jesus in his gospel. And I want to look at our text this morning, not probably a very common text on Resurrection Sunday, but we're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I want to look at the miracles of Jesus' ministry. And then we're going to look at the miracle of the resurrection. And I want to look at miracles after the resurrection. So we're going to be talking about miracles. And as we look at these various miracles, I want you to remember the words written in verse 31 in our text. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you, if you look at the miracles of Jesus and do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you will have completely missed the point. John doesn't just write what he writes randomly or for no reason or for no purpose, but he actually spells out very clearly what his purpose is. Why did he write the 21 chapters of his book? Why, why did he write what he wrote? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you look at the miracles of Jesus again and you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, you've missed it. In fact, it's worse than just missing the point. But we'll discuss that in a little bit. Let's talk about the miracles of his ministry. It's, it's interesting to note that of the four Gospels, John actually records the least amount of miracles in his book. Anybody want to throw out a number of how many miracles he mentions in his book? Come on, pick a number. Nope. Nope, but it's in between the two. Seven. There you go. Seven. Only seven. You'll find a lot more in some of the other books. Only seven. Notice it isn't because it isn't because of lack of material. It isn't for lack of miracles performed. But he was very focused on what he wrote. And again, he wrote the ones that he did. Why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John 21, verse 25, he says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. And then he says, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I think he had enough material. It wasn't for lack of, 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 of resources. But he had a purpose in what he included. Here are the seven miracles that he included. Changing water into wine. I don't think it was on a little water cooler like that, but uh, healing the royal official's son, healing the paralytic at the pool, feeding over 5,000 with fish and chips, I mean fish and loaves, walking on water, healing a man born blind and raising Lazarus from the dead. Each one of these miracles shows Jesus as having power over various things. He has power over physical matter. He changes water into Merlot. He has power to heal by his word without being present. He tells the royal official, your son will live. He didn't go to them at all from, a, from somewhere else. He said, your son will live. He has power over paralysis. The paralytic at the pool is healed. He has power to multiply matter, feeding over 5,000 with one serving of fish and chips. Power over physics, walking on water. I, I'm, I, it is not surprising that the disciples were scared out of their minds. Didn't often see people walking across the lake on the water, right? Jesus has power over physics. He has power over blindness, heals the man born blind, has power over death. We find in John 11, the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. All of these miracles speak to the deity of Jesus Christ. He has power over everything. And so John established that. Could he, could he have added more? Sure. 
But I think what he has given to us establishes pretty clearly that he is the son of God, that he is deity. He has power over all of these things. He's God in the flesh. And we know that even from the very first verses of the gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Who is this who is described as the word? It is Jesus he is describing here. And so you can really read this verse. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. He is creator God. And so obviously it's understandable that he has power over all of these things. In these first few verses, what do we find? The creator has invaded earth. <laughs> in a wonderful, wonderful way. So here's the question. These various miracles that Jesus did, why did he do them? Is it, is it so he can get attention? There's actually a passage in Luke that would kind of put that idea to rest. Take a look at Luke uh, chapter 4, verses 40 through 44. It says, now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leave, leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He spent an evening healing all the people, and then the next morning they go to find him because there's more people that need healing. There's more people who are sick. There's more people who are troubled. And he says, I'm out of here. If he was just looking for attention, he would have stuck around and kept on healing people, right? But he doesn't. In fact, he says, I didn't come here just to do miracles. I came here, what's, my, what's his purpose? I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Why does he not keep doing miracles? Because that's not why he came. He came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. People today especially seem to be fascinated with miracles, fascinated with signs and wonders. And I'm afraid they're missing the point. Even when Jesus was on the earth doing signs and wonders, what was the purpose? So that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing they may have life in his name. He came to preach the good news. The miracles verified that he was deity and that he had the right to proclaim what he was proclaiming. But the purpose of, of, of why he came was to preach the good news. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's go ahead and look at the miracle of the resurrection. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will, I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. 
I want you to picture me a few days ago sitting at Stir writing this sermon. <laughs> and I read this passage and I'm, and I'm crying in the coffee place, hoping that people aren't recognizing the weirdo sitting there. Um, but it's so gripping. Here she is just devastated. Where is Jesus? Talking to him and not even realizing. And yet when he looks at her and says, Mary, and she just, her whole world changed at that moment. What an incredible thing. What an intimate thing our relationship with God is. He knows your name and he knows it well. <laughs> and when he says your name, when, we, he, when he calls unto you, friends, respond, believe. Jesus had told his disciples that after he was dead for three days, he would rise from the dead. I've often wondered why they were so surprised when he did. He told them he would. He told them a lot of other things and he did all those things. Why are you shocked? <laughs> but then I look at myself and I say, I probably would have done the same thing. It would have been like, oh, wow. So many of God's promises in his word I know to be true, and yet I find myself doubting them. How foolish and how fickle we can be. Mary comes to the tomb. She's come to the right place if she wants to be where Jesus is not. <laughs> and I can't imagine the joy that must have flooded her heart when she realized who she was talking to, when, 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 the, when the lights came on, right? It wasn't the gardener. It was the one who created the ground in the garden, <laughs> But again, what is the point of this passage regarding the resurrected Lord? The point was that the victory over death had been won. Jesus was ascending to the Father, his God, and her God. It's about the fulfillment of all that she had believed. And one who properly understands the resurrection knows that Jesus conquered death. Why? So that we would believe and have life in his name. The miracle of the resurrection, as amazing as it might be, is completely meaningless if it does not result in belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and having life in his name. If all, if all that the resurrection is, is a historical fact, a historical point, if, if we can say that we understand even from historical records, not even biblical records, but historical records, and we can, and prove that Christ raised from the dead, but if all we do is say, yep, we know it happened. Sure did. I believe it happened. Great. So what? If you haven't believed that Jesus is the son of God and that by believing have life in his name, the resurrection is meaningless. Why do we have the resurrection? So that we would believe. Now, I could spend hours arguing the many proofs of the resurrection. We could look at it from philosophical, philosophical arguments, historical arguments, biblical arguments, and, and the veracity of the scriptures, all of that. The changed lives of the disciples is quite sufficient for me, to be honest. Perhaps you've been to many Easter services at church, and, and you hear the miracle of the resurrection, and you continue to harden your heart, refusing to believe. How tragic. I like how Tim Timothy Keller put it. He said this, he said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he has rose from the dead. And that really is the rub of it, isn't it? There are some who will refuse to their dying day to believe in the miracle of the resurrection because they're smart enough to realize the implications for their lives. God wants you to believe in him with all of your heart and that by believing that you may have life in his name. And if Christ has been raised, then everything else he said is true and you're accountable for what you know. How tragic it is that those there are those who see the proof of it, see the truth of it, and refuse to believe. Thirdly, this morning, let's look at miracles after the resurrection. So how about now? Are there still miracles that God is doing? I would say yes. Now, I would also say that I do not believe that we can bark at God and tell him what to do and command him to perform for us like some kind of a circus monkey. 
I tell you, it gets more and more offensive when you watch some of these preachers on TV. And just you just tell God what He's going to do, and you decree it, you declare it, you claim it, you this. You, God is not just, I don't snap my fingers and God steps, oh, oh my, Kevin, you want me to do this? Oh, okay, all right, all right, Kevin, I'll, I'll go do that. No, He doesn't do that. He's sovereign. He's God. He's the creator of the universe. And, and we need to be careful. This idea of demanding miracles. You, there's plenty of guys out there. If you send them a, you send them a check for $1,000, they'll guarantee you miracles. Good luck receiving them. That's not the kind of miracles I think that we, we see today. And, and I don't think we should be demanding miraculous signs. Jesus had something to say about those who demand signs. Did you know that? He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Which is interesting because the sign of Jonah was that like Jonah was three nights in the belly of a fish, Jesus would rise from the dead after being three nights in the tomb. <laughs> so what kind of miracles do we see after the resurrection? Look at Jesus' words in John 14. John 14, 12, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Whoever believes, we've been talking about that today. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now, what does he mean that we'll do greater things because he's going to the Father? Be careful if your interpretation of that means miracles and healings because you remember that Jesus raised himself from the dead, right? Anybody think that you're going to do anything greater than that? I don't think so. So what's he talking about? Uh, I don't think we're going to be doing greater miracles than resurrection, pretty sure. Jesus is actually talking about the Holy Spirit who would come and indwell every single believer in Christ. After he left, what happened? The Holy Spirit came. And because of the Holy Spirit, the miracle of people becoming transformed from death to life is a reality. The Holy Spirit changes our hearts, draws us to Christ, convicts us of sin, and empowers us to place our faith in Jesus Christ. And there is no greater miracle on this earth, my friend, than a person repenting of their sin and going from eternal death to eternal life. There is nothing greater in all the world, nothing more miraculous than the transformation that Christ does in the lives of people who are bound in sin and then become children of God. Nothing greater. No greater miracle. And every one of you that has placed your faith in Christ, guess what? You're part of that miracle. You're part of those greater things that Jesus promised. Those of us who have received Christ as Lord and Savior are walking miracles and have the privilege of being used by God to share that miracle that we've received with others. As the Holy Spirit transforms lives, we see greater miracles. We've talked about miracles, and they're wonderful, but they have a purpose. If John wanted to, he could have included a whole bunch more. But he wrote what he wrote for a reason. It is so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Friends, that is my prayer for everyone here. I, I would not want anyone to walk out of this room having not believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for the Apostle John and how he encourages our hearts that beyond just the factual reality of the miracles that you performed, including the resurrection, it is so much more important that we take what we've heard and we see the evidence and we respond by believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing we may have life in his name. Lord, it is my deepest prayer that 
everyone here can say that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that they would have life in your name. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.